Okay. Uh, let me start with a map. Usually this is very useful, uh, especially when we are not meeting in Cyprus, because most people uh, need to get oriented. But clearly here, uh, those attending, those uh, hearing via the web, probably it's useful. You managed to come here, so you know where we are. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, although we are um, in Europe, we are a member of uh, EU, Eurozone, etc., is the only country uh, in the Middle East of the European Union. Uh, so it's, uh, and actually this is related to the mission of our institute uh, to be a gateway between the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Middle East and Europe. Uh, we are as far away from Athens as we are from Baghdad. Most Cypriots are shocked when they hear this. They never thought of it. Uh, and we are as far away from Rome as we are, let's say, from Doha. Uh, we are in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East, and this is why this conference is focusing on this as part of our job to do it. Um, the, so the rationale of addressing this uh, is uh, geography, but there are also in underlining considerations that I will uh, uh, start uh, to, you'll see at the end, concerning geopolitics. Uh, this is, as everybody knows, is a very difficult region. Uh, the circle of 1,000 kilometers has about 350 million. Uh, it's very diverse. You have the highest uh, concentration of fossil resources in the area. You have uh, wars. You have uh, uh, very different religious, educational, technological uh, levels, etc. Uh, it's one of the cradles of civilization. And the implications of what happens in this region are truly international. What happens here, it will not be localized. And I will come to this point uh, later. So although the context is regional, the implication uh, is uh, international. Uh, OK, I will skip the, uh, the introductory slides about the weather. We heard it from Banos, and I'm going to save a lot of time since I knew that he was going uh, to cover this. Uh, already the takeaway points is this region is a hot spot. As I said in my comment earlier, it's okay to talk about global averages 1.5, but impacts, implications, etc., have to be studied regionally. There will be different implications for hotspots like uh, this one here, or for Antarctica, another hotspot, or the North Pole. Uh, very different. So it's okay to talk about global because if we, are, we want to have global policy, but we have to understand the problems, the impacts, and therefore the solutions regionally. Uh, let's take a, just uh, to see how bad this region is in exacerbating the problem. Uh, the CO2 emissions in this area uh, are not significant. Uh, basically, emissions uh, is, a, is a G2, maybe maybe G3 problem. OK, maybe G7. Uh, and uh, so it's not uh, insignificant on the global budget, but it's not a driver. It's not US, it's not China, it's not uh, uh, India. Uh, you can see some hotspots around uh, the Nile Delta. You see Istanbul. You see interesting uh, Iraq. Uh, around the Emirates, there are hot spots of emissions, but it's not uh, something that even we stop a meeting from there will make no difference on the global uh, balance of things. It will make contribution. It will not be a driver. What is interesting is that the Middle East has a very different uh, trend than the uh, European, let's say, the, the EU. You see EU is leveling off or declining, UK and France. You look Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, the major contributors in this area. The, it's small, but rising, and actually the projections, this is a rather conservative uh, scenario, 
they will probably rise much more rapidly. Okay, something to, to also uh, take home. The challenge is that uh, all, and we have heard uh, uh, the previous presentation, all climate models, so it's a robust for the prediction, predict that the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East region is going to be affected adversely, very badly, by climate change. Extreme weather, principally heat waves, uh, the group, the modern group has uh, done an exceedingly nice uh, work on that, but uh, Panos didn't show it. I'll show one slide. Uh, because it that has to do with energy. It has big implications on energy. Shortage of water is probably more important than anything else. Uh, in this region, there have been many wars about water, and probably there will be more. Uh, not one about electricity, not yet, at least that I know of, but we tend to focus on electricity. Water is a more an important driver in terms of uh, geopolitics. Shortage of electricity, health is going to be an issue. Agriculture, the last slide that Pano showed already, is it's very, very important. We'll come back to it. And we are not going the extra step. And I'll say now, I'll say it at the end. There may be an economic collapse in areas and countries. And this will induce migration. It will bring security issues. And all these scenarios that we're considering to negative will capture CO2 and will implement measures to ameliorate the situation later on. Maybe there will be no social cohesion or order in a chaotic world with conflicts, mass migration, to even have the luxury to address. We have a minute migration problem in Europe now. You see almost the EU is falling apart. Uh, and you put the social, socioeconomic layer on it, which is not discussed in this type of conferences, it's discussed maybe in other conferences and so on, and it doesn't look so optimistic. We have seen this, I won't repeat, hotspot here, but I want to focus on the water. Even in the best scenario, and this was shown uh, by Panos, uh, if we look at uh, the, the water shortage, uh, the, um, which is this one, even in the best uh, scenario, we'll have further reduction of uh, rainfall. Of course, it was already measured vis-a-vis -vis the study in Crete. We'll have more evaporation because of the, of the climate change. So the things get even worse. And this all has been put together uh, in a very, very nice study by the World Bank, where they really did a very comprehensive study. And uh, if you look at this slide, uh, you can see in the blue band at the bottom the deficit by the middle of the century. And if you remember from the, from the slides that Pan showed, things really don't take off till the middle of the century. Already in the area, in the MENA region, there will be a deficit of water as big as, yeah, it's about, uh, not as big, it's about 60% of the water used today. It's huge. It's huge. And I said, there were wars and still there are major conflicts called hydropolitics, actually, et cetera, et cetera, in the area about the available water today. This is the forecast, a very thorough study by the World Bank. And the message is that by the middle of the century, already, we don't know how to, to address this problem. OK. Uh, there will be more, I refer to the talk of uh, Mikhail Skoulos uh, on this issue, uh, I believe, tomorrow. A very interesting modeling that was done by the uh, climate, our climate group, uh, Palestinian Mission, is uh, 
the number of hot days that will uh, increase in the area. And we have major cities here, Ankara, Athens, Bahrain, Beirut, uh, uh, Istanbul, Nicosia. Look at the change is not 5%, it's times 5. The uh, times 8, the best you can get is 50% in a place that is already uh, unbearably hot. So if you want to put it in simple terms, is that uh, if you want to know how Nicosia will look uh, by the end of the century in the business as usual, I believe, scenario, is, it, is it correct? Uh, you just go to Bahrain or go to Cairo, because you would become like Cairo. If you want to see how uh, Beirut will uh, be in, at the end of the century, come to Nicosia. And if you want to see how Istanbul will be at the end of the century, would be like Nicosia. Uh, even worse, this scenario does not include the heat island effect, which will add, adds a lot, as we know. So it's, uh, it's going to be uh, really tremendous. What does it mean? Who said it? I believe uh, it's our chair who said that most of the electricity goes in the cities. So the electricity demand, take this, and uh, actually they have done it for tropical nights, and there the effect, as you predicted, is much higher. The increase in tropical nights, meaning nights that are stay above, uh, uh, 25 degrees, uh, it's uh, it's much bigger effect than this. Uh, so in the built environment, you'll need a lot of air conditioning. And how much? A lot. And the bad news is that not everybody can afford it. Cairo is a 20 million uh, plus uh, city, uh, cannot afford to be air conditioned. There is not the resources, not the, the richness. So we'll come to the implications. How much uh, power? Actually, this is a nice work by Manto Sada Muris. Uh, and uh, for one degree increase, you have to increase the power uh, for a city about 14%. Two degree increase, you have to go 34% up. Three degrees, and this is the kind of ranges we have seen in the previous talk, 55% increase in the electricity. Uh, to make continue to have the city functioning as it, it was uh, before the temperature increase. Okay, uh, there I'll uh, refer to the talk about build environment uh, uh, by Despina Sergidis, who is sitting in the audience uh, following up that. So, public health, the temperature in the city is rising. Not all of the cities in the area are of the are like uh, Copenhagen. Uh, there would be increase in diseases. There would be stresses and so on. Also, because vector-borne disease, uh, diseases uh, are going to intrude, and actually the the air quality is going to get worse. We have increase of dust storms. The on and on. Uh, Actually, an interesting study was done by our group here, the modern group, is following this, the vector-borne diseases are moving north. The mosquitoes are, are, are moving north. You can see the global study here. And you see they are moving from North Africa now to Southern Europe if, in a two-degree scenario. Uh, and we see this already. This year, there was an outbreak of West Nile uh, disease in Greece. I believe 20 or so people died. This was unknown 10 years ago. Uh, mosquitoes have arrived from the tiger mosquitoes that have arrived, and they love it, the new climate here and in northern, uh, southern Europe. Uh, and uh, projections are that if it goes beyond, all, the, all of Europe will see uh, this. Middle East doesn't have the health system that uh, Europe has, so the implications there are also dire. Streams. And this is a publication by the uh, by the modeling group here. Make really big waves because they stressed that this means migration. This is in the referred literature. So they project tens of billions of people because of collapse of agriculture, of uh, cities, etc., may result from the Middle East. And guess where they want to go? 
And as I said, a minute by this scale migration issue is bringing uh, European Union uh, to its knees. Uh, and it's in this context that all this scenario about new technologies and about the implementing renewables and capturing uh, carbon have to be implemented. Somehow we refuse to see that it's a highly non-linear social problem. Okay? So this triggered a lot of attention, actually. It was in New York Times, BBC, the Voice of America, etc. And I, this is good in a way, because politicians, when they heard this, they said, oh, tell us more about climate change. And what can we do about it? They wouldn't listen uh, if, if it wasn't for political instability and social threat, which is real. So <clears throat> we have, a, a, I believe, a reasonable understanding of the challenges. This group knows that we do have the technology Actually, it's a conservative uh, statement to partially address them. Some will say we have the technology to address them. Even the market forces, as we have heard, and it was very nicely documented before, are in the right direction. The economics are now, we have seen PV, uh, uh, weed, etc., are not only affordable, they're competitive. It's just it was made, made very nicely shown before, even if it's exponentially rising, exponential rises very fast, but it depends where you start. So the time scale is the problem. The time scale, we don't have enough time for the market forces to take uh, place because all these dangers I outlined before may come in and kill. The uh, market forces, remember, killed, I was in the States at the time, the renewable energy uh, uh, drive that was in the 70s because of the oil crisis. Practically died uh, for, uh, because of a minor compared to this uh, uh, situation concerning oil prices. So market will not solve this. It's, uh, and the time scales are horrible. We have a problem that will trigger irreversible uh, technological, climatic, melting of ice is irreversible, uh, acidification, no matter what you do, uh, you may block the sun, the acid is not going to go away, uh, irreversible uh, uh, trends that the time solutions we have and we're discussing do not match. So what do we do? Well, this area is blessed with the best uh, solar potential. This map has not been shown before, uh, but you know, this community knows it. The DNA is superb. Uh, CSP and PV, of course, uh, are excellent. And there is a lot of seawater. So it's beautiful, generates a lot of tourism, beautiful sunsets, and, uh, and actually, unfortunately, dust storms often make even better uh, <laughs> sunsets. Uh, the sea is there. We have to use it. Uh, I'll um, briefly touch upon, because there will be other uh, uh, discussions, uh, that we have to uh, uh, use desalination. So it's partial, cannot do due to the agriculture, not yet, but certainly the CD problem can be alleviated, and certainly electricity, etc. There will be uh, lectures there. We have this uh, experimental solar facility uh, for uh, trying cogeneration of, uh, of electricity and seawater, and uh, the, uh, um, there will be some lectures on it. Uh, I want to voice uh, uh, probably a, it is a, some disagreement with the uh, conventional wisdom Solar desalination, and does not mean RO, I mean CSP in conjunction with uh, thermal desalination, is feasible and economically viable. And I think we should debate that. Uh, Diego uh, uh, will address, I believe, uh, this issue uh, tomorrow. 
So uh, I will skip the uh, details of this uh, plan. There will be a uh, discussion about this uh, also. Next to door, you probably have seen there is a Fresnel uh, 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 facility it's in the adjacent roof, cooling this building, which was designed to be a zero energy building. We are in, in an experiment right now. Uh, is driven by a Fresnel uh, thing and photovoltaics on the roof, if you have seen it. Uh, and there will be talks about it by uh, Alaric Mondanon and uh, Fabio Mondanino. Mondanon, Mondanino, somehow it's a mountain issue. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, the way this building is heated, climatized, is, uh, is uh, what you expect. I will, I'll leave it to Alaric uh, to discuss it. And, uh, okay, uh, I won't explain it. I don't have the time. So let me conclude by a few slides about this. So is anybody listening? We're talking, we're convinced. Well, some of them are listening. Uh, well, <laughs> we don't like uh, what they're saying. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, is anybody listening? Well, some are listening, but we don't see much traction. Uh, actually, I was uh, at the meeting of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences uh, 10 days ago, uh, and the Pope came out with a very strong statement, much stronger than uh, some of the politicians. Okay, some are listening and responding. Uh, it's a pretty strong statement. Uh, uh, but anyway, I mean, he doesn't, uh, the Vatican is a small area to implement, to make it green, although it would be a good project. Uh, but so some are listening. Okay, what we have done here, and I will conclude with this, because this conference is really an outgrowth of this uh, activity. We had a major climate conference in uh, May. Uh, you recognize there the three people in the center, probably, or some of them. One is Laurent Fabius, the architect of, uh, of the COP21 agreement in Paris. He was here. He gave us a, what has happened since then. It was not a good message. Basically, he said what we know. Things are, people are, nations are not adhering. Things are not moving in the right direction. Geoffrey Sachs is the the economist, the advisor to the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations on sustainable development. Stronger message. Wake up. We are going uh, the wrong way. And the uh, third gentleman is uh, uh, Commissioner, EU Commissioner Christos Tilianidis. Interesting. For humanitarian aid and crisis management. Okay? So some people are listening. The president, it will take me a couple of minutes to, to conclude, sorry. Uh, the president of the republic listened. Okay, following that on the climate, uh, on the, it, uh, a month later, uh, he announced a presidential initiative uh, to coordinate regional action uh, on climate and coordinate, we cannot, it's small to do anything on the CO2, but coordinate amelioration and uh, policies in the region and coordination of technical solutions that may be used. Here we come in uh, to do that. And she asked that we provide technological suggestions for policy options for the region to help address the impacts and help also decarbonize. So this is how uh, things come together. Uh, so uh, engage the stakeholders, etc. So climate impacts in the Emma region, and we have to start from there before we discuss uh, the decarbonization. They go hand in hand, but that's the starting point. Particularly uh, challenging, dire regional and international implications. If this, if the fertile crescent collapses, as it was shown in the last uh, paragraph, remember 350 million reside in this region. Unfortunately, I hate to say this, Micronesia will be probably 
the first uh, to go because of, uh, of but there were suggestions to put few million people, move them, I don't know where. You cannot move 350 million people elsewhere. It's a global issue that if it comes to social and economic collapse, all scenarios for mitigation would go to pieces. And politicians will listen if we insist, instead of not only providing them that yes, we have the solution, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, we have a problem. We have to understand the problem together and try to understand if our solution, one of the many, makes sense in this context. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Costas. Uh, that, that was a tough pill to swallow, though. I, you know, in the United States, all the news lately has been um, a few thousand people, migrants from Honduras, coming up to the United States, largely because of the extended drought in Honduras. And that, that is so, it's created all sorts of disruption in U.S. politics. And, and to think about the size of the migrations that you're talking about uh, and the impacts that would have, it's, it's just incredible. Um, anybody uh, questions? We have time for a few questions for Costas. So it so, looks like the pill was too tough. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what are your thoughts about? Uh, I mean, you you mentioned the opportunity for solar energy and desalination. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what you really need is to get the rest of the world to stop emitting carbon, right? So that you know, this area doesn't keep heating up and you don't wind up with water shortages. What, so what, what, what are your thoughts about that? How, how, can, how can this region be more vocal and, and maybe get across the message that the ramifications here are enormous? Well, um, the message, and this is what we're practicing, is that this a new community, actually a surprise, even the convinced politicians at the end of this very important conference we had in May, which really was at the level uh, yeah. unprecedented. We had Fabius, we had Sachs, we had uh, some of even these politicians, when I tried to discuss CSP, they didn't know. They thought, oh, it's only PV, the, the storage is batteries and they're too expensive. So the message is not getting through that we do have solutions. Hmm. As you, I think you pointed out, there will be new cities being built actually till the end of the century, will build as many cities as they exist today. Mm -hmm. uh, the built environment issue is huge. It, so the toolbox of solutions is not even, we don't communicate that people that are listening, a lot of people are listening, especially if they understand the implication. Mm -hmm. They will listen, but we need also to make known the toolbox and the series of conferences we are going to have, it's trying to help this presidential initiative, is to bring the focus always back on the driver, which is the climate change, How much? and then develop toolbox, toolbox of actions that politicians will have to decide which ones to choose and how to use them. We are not politicians, but it's our responsibility as scientists to bring the toolbox solution vis-a-vis -vis a problem, not technology or policy neutral. It's to solve a big problem. And we refrain as scientists from daring to say this. It's wrong, that's my opinion. Could, could water desalination really help to, to delay the need for this migration out of the area? Oh, this is something, I, I don't think we know the answer uh, because the, um, the impact on agriculture, it's a very, very complex uh, issue. Uh, it's, uh, it would be irresponsible to just give an answer. It's a big problem. We know uh, the threat, uh, but uh, now finding the appropriate tools to solve it, uh, as you know, this year's Nobel Prize was given to somebody who has worked on this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Northhouse from Yale, you, I think you mentioned him. Yes. Uh, he was the one who modeled, actually, agriculture and climate change. For economics, uh, right? For economics. Uh, yes. So it's, it's been recognized. Uh, but uh, not is, even those studies are not advancing at the pace which is not so expensive that uh, is appropriate, let alone uh, find the, uh, the, the appropriate solutions. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kostas. Somebody. Yes, uh, which, I have a question. Yeah. Another question. Uh, we know that uh, after climate change, we will have problems. And you mentioned economic collapse. So can you tell about this? Well, uh, we can have a, probably there will be more discussions of it. I'll give you two, 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 two things. One is agriculture and the other one is city living. Take a mega city or even a big city, a few million. Uh, I don't know if you have seen such cities in the Middle East, let alone uh, having running water is a luxury. Air conditioning is out of the question. If the temperatures that we showed coming out of the model group exacerbated by heat island effects, which is typically two to three degrees. I don't know, that's when I'm going to discuss this. Yeah, we'll hear about it more. Then we reach the le level of inhabitability. People will die, the humans cannot live in a protracted temperature more than 37 degrees, they die. We cannot get rid of the heat, we do. So either they sit there and die, people don't do that, or they move. And if people move, those that they move into, generally, as we have seen, are not very friendly, even if they're rich. So that's one thing. Second is collapse of agriculture. Not only humans will die, the animals will die first. You air condition your bedroom before you air condition the, the cow's uh, barn. You will hear more about it. <laughs> okay, thanks.